Hey everyone, welcome to this new video on basics of Six Sigma by Simply Learn. Before we begin, consider subscribing to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. In this video, we will start by knowing what Six Sigma is, what are the benefits of Six Sigma. Moving ahead, we will see what is Lean Six Sigma and understand the major difference between Six Sigma and Lean Six Sigma. Then we will dive deeper into Six Sigma Green Belt training and by the end of this video, we will list some important Six Sigma tools. To make your journey more successful in Six Sigma, we introduce you postgraduate program in Lean Six Sigma by Simply Learn. Some key features of this program are joint postgraduate program certificate from UMass, Amherst and KPMG in India, master classes by senior consultants from KPMG, 8x more live interactions with Lean Six Sigma experts, 100% money back guarantee, capstone projects from 6 domains, 3 hardwood case studies, 17 hands-on projects and 18 simulation exams and much more. The skills you will acquire through this course include Agile Management, Quality Management, Lean Management, Minitab, Lean Six Sigma Green Belt and Black Belt, and Digital Transformation. With these skills, you will also gain expertise in the tools like Zira. So, what are you waiting for? Grab the course now, find the course link in the description box. Listen to our happy learners what they say about our course. Even after working for 18 years, I believe you are never too old to learn new skills and acquire knowledge to excel further and keep up the growth. That's why I decided to upskill myself to hone my skills to improve my performance in my current organization. The course not only helped me to acquire skills and get certified, but also gave me a decent salary hike. Hey, I am Aditya Kaneria. I live in Pune with my family. I am currently working as a quality manager at the Saw System Global Services. I recently got certified in the postgraduate program in Lean Six Sigma in collaboration with UMass Armrest from Simply Learn. I am a curious learner and continuous improvement is my motto. This isn't the first time I choose Simply Learn to upskill myself. I even took the project management course earlier, which motivated me to go for another one. I am working in the quality management domain for 18 years now. When I was assigned the position of quality manager, I decided to take up the course in Lean Six Sigma. I wanted to make sure that I am fully updated with all the recent case studies to master myself in the field of quality management. The course boosted my knowledge of case studies from Harvard Business Publishing and Capstone Project from KPMG in India that provide real-world Lean and Six Sigma exposure. One of the best attractions of Simplifying course is its well-structured course content that consists of all the industry-relevant modules and projects. The concepts were easier to learn thanks to the pedagogy of the faculty. Everything they taught was practical and experience-driven. Even the support team made the learning smoother because of their instant response and quick problem solving. The certification has already made me stand out from the crowd and has brought me closer to my goal of excelling in the field of quality management. In my leisure time, I spend my time cooking delicious food and trying my hands at new recipes. I also love photography and enjoy clicking pictures with my DSLR. Learning keeps me thriving for perfection. It keeps me growing professionally because growth is the only constant that leads to success. So without any further ado, let's begin. Over to our experts. Imagine you've been tasked with a really important project at work. The company you're working for produces luxury cars. The production numbers are going down and a lesser number of cars are getting manufactured each day. There also seems to be an issue with the quality of the windshield wipers that go on these cars. The question you are faced with, is there a way for the company to stop the stall in production and increase the production per day from 1,000 to 2,000? Also, is there a way to find out what's causing the drop in the wiper quality? There is Six Sigma. Six Sigma gives you the tools and techniques to determine what's making the manufacturing process slow down how you can eliminate the delays, improve the process, and fix further issues along the way. The concept was introduced in 1980 by Bill Smith while working for Motorola. Since then, Six Sigma has seen worldwide adoption. Six Sigma aims to reduce the time, defects, and variability experienced by processes in an organization. Thanks to Six Sigma, you can produce a defect-free product 99.9996% of the time. 
allowing only 3.4 errors per 1 million opportunities. Six Sigma also increases customer loyalty towards the brand, improves employee morale, leading to higher productivity. Six Sigma has two major methodologies, DMAIC and DMADV. Let's look at the first methodology. DMAIC is an acronym for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. Let's have a look at each of these stages individually and how it relates to your earlier problem. In the Define phase, you determine what issues you're facing, what your opportunities for improvement are, and what the customer requires of you. Here, you look at the process as a whole and determine the issues with the manufacturing process. In this case, finding out why the cars had varying windshield wiper quality and how to optimize the current process to manufacture more cars. In the measure phase, you determine how the process is performing currently in its unaltered state. You determine the current number of cars that are manufactured in a day. In the current scenario, 1,000 cars are manufactured in a day, and each of these cars are outfitted with a pair of windshield wipers by one of 30 machines used. Some of the metrics measured are how many cars are produced in a day, time taken to assemble a car, how many windshield wipers were attached in a day, time that takes them to do so, defects detected from each machine on assembly completion, and so on. Following this, in the Analyze phase, you determine what caused the defect or variation. On analyzing previous data, you find out that one of the machines that installed the windshield wiper was not performing as well as it was supposed to. Production was taking longer since the car chassis was being moved across the different locations slower, as cranes had to individually pick and drop the frame. This was because the wheels were attached to the car only in the last stage. Next, in the Improve phase, you make changes to the manufacturing process and ensure the defects are addressed. You replace the faulty machines that installed the windshield wiper with another one. You also find a way to save time by attaching wheels on the frame in the initial stages of the manufacturing process, unlike how it was done earlier. Now, the car can be moved across the assembly area faster. And finally, in the Control phase, you make regular adjustments to control new processes and future performance. Based on the changes made, the company was able to reduce production time and manufacture about 2,000 cars a day with a higher quality of output. DMAIC is one of the most commonly used methodologies in the world. It focuses on improving the existing products of the organization. The second methodology is DMADV, which is short for Define, Measure, Analyze, Design, and Verify. It is used when the company has to create a new product or service from scratch. It is also called DFSS, or Design for Six Sigma. Let's take the scenario where the company decides to build a new model, a sports car. In the Define phase, you define the requirements of the customer. Based on inputs from customers, historical data, industry research, you determine what you need to ensure your car becomes a success. The data collected indicates customers are drawn to cars which can achieve more than 150 miles per hour. Customers are also more inclined towards cars which have V6 engines and an aerodynamic frame. Then, in the measure phase, you use the customer's requirements to create a specification. This specification helps define the product in a measurable method, so that data can be collected and compared with specific requirements. Some of the major specifications that you focus on are the top speed, engine type, and type of frame. In the Analyze phase, you analyze the product to determine whether there are better ways to achieve the desired results. Areas of improvement are determined and tested. Based on the analysis of the prototype created in this phase, you find that the product satisfies just about all of the customer requirements, except the top speed. So, research begins on an aluminum alloy that could possibly meet the speed requirements of the customer. Following this, the design phase, based on the learnings from the analysis phase, the new process or product is designed. Revisions are made to the model, and the car is manufactured with the new material. The analysis phase is repeated based on the new design. You also bring a focus group and see how they receive it. Based on their feedback, further changes are made. And finally, in the verify phase, you check whether the end result meets or exceeds customer requirements. 
Once you launch your brand new sports car, you collect customer feedback and incorporate it into future designs. And guess what? Your customers are loving the new design. And that is DMADV for you. Six Sigma has also found success in a number of different industries. The petrochemical, healthcare, banking, government, and software are some of the industries that have utilized the concepts of Six Sigma to achieve their business goals. Another commonly used methodology adopted by companies around the world is Lean. Lean is a methodology that aims to remove any part of the process that does not bring value to the customer. It means doing more with less while doing it better. The philosophy behind Lean comes from the Japanese manufacturing industry by Bob Hartman, who at the time was part of Toyota. Since then, across the world, services and manufacturing organizations have incorporated Lean within their businesses. But what if you could have the best of both worlds? A combination of both Six Sigma and Lean. That's Lean Six Sigma. The organizational benefits of Six Sigma are as follows. A Six Sigma process eliminates the root cause of problems and defects in a process. Sometimes the solution is creating robust products and services that mitigate the impact of a variable input or output on a customer's experience. For example, many electrical utility systems have voltage variability up to and sometimes exceeding a 10% deviation from nominal value. Thus, most electrical products are built to tolerate the variability, drawing more amperage without damage to any components or the unit itself. Using Six Sigma reduces variation in a process and thereby reduces waste in a process. It ensures customer satisfaction and provides process standardization. Rework is substantially reduced because one gets it right the very first time. Further, Six Sigma addresses the key business requirement. Six Sigma can also be used by organizations to gain advantage and become world leaders in their respective fields. Ultimately, the whole Six Sigma process is to satisfy customers and achieve organizational goals. Let us understand how Six Sigma works in this screen. Six Sigma is successful because of the following reasons. Six Sigma is a management strategy. It creates an environment where the management supports Six Sigma as a business strategy and not as a standalone approach or a program to satisfy some public relations need. Six Sigma mainly emphasizes the DMAC method of problem solving. Focus teams are assigned well-defined projects that directly influence the organization's bottom line with customer satisfaction and increased quality being byproducts. Six Sigma also requires extensive use of statistical methods. Imagine you're the manager of a supermarket chain. You've noticed that two things need your immediate attention. The first issue is how to handle the different kinds of waste that you encounter at your supermarket. The next one requires you to address the supply chain issues at the supermarket, which are causing delays to the morning delivery of milk, leading to customer dissatisfaction and attrition. These problems can be solved by incorporating two of the most popular quality management methodologies in the world, Lean and Six Sigma. One famous for its ability to handle waste, and another known for process improvement. But. What if there was a methodology that combined the concepts of both Six Sigma and Lean? One that could solve all your issues? Well, there is Lean Six Sigma. Before we dive into Lean Six Sigma, let's take a closer look at its parent methodologies. First off, Lean is a methodology that focuses on providing value to the customer, eliminating waste, continuous improvement, reducing cycle time, Lean and Six Sigma both aim to handle waste. But what is this waste? Waste is any step or action in the process that a user does not gain any value from. In short, things that users wouldn't want to pay for. Why would a consumer want to pay extra for the additional truck that was required to deliver milk to the supermarket just because the other one broke down? This waste can be divided into eight categories. Let's have a look at each of them. One. Transportation. This waste refers to the excess movement of people, tools, inventory, equipment, and other components of a process than it is required. 
2. Inventory This waste occurs due to having more products and materials than required. This can cause damage and defects to products or materials, greater time for completion, inefficient allocation of capital, and so on. 3. Motion This refers to the time and effort wasted due to unnecessary movement of people, equipment, or machinery. This could be sitting through inventory, double data entry, and so on. 4. Waiting This can be time wasted waiting on information, instructions, materials, or equipment. 5. Overproduction This is the waste created due to producing more products than required. 6. Overprocessing It refers to more work, more components, or more steps in a product or service than required. 7. Defects This is the waste originating from a product or service that fails to meet customer expectations. 8. Skills This waste refers to the waste of human potential, underutilizing capabilities, and delegating tasks to people with inadequate training. For years now, many systems have emerged that use the lean methodology to identify and handle the different kinds of waste. Some of the more popular and effective ones are JIT, or Just-in-Time, 5S, and Kanban. The JIT methodology focuses on reducing the amount of time the production system takes to provide an output, and the response time from suppliers to customers. 5S is another methodology that focuses on cleanliness in organization, while improving profits and efficiency. Kanban is also another popular methodology to achieve lean. It is a visual method to manage tasks and workflows. Kanban enables users visualize the workflow to identify issues in the process and fix them. These methodologies help in optimizing the waste production and are often used together to maximize results. So that's the first problem solved. Now let's have a look at how you can improve the supermarket supply chain efficiency. For that, let's have a look at the other part of Lean Six Sigma. Six Sigma Six Sigma is a set of tools and techniques that are used for process improvement and removing defects. Let's see how Six Sigma makes that possible. Six Sigma has two major methodologies, DMAIC and DMADV. You can learn more about these two methodologies by checking out our Six Sigma in 9 minutes video by clicking on the top right corner. Let's have a closer look at DMAIC. Since Lean Six Sigma uses the DMAIC methodology of Six Sigma, DMAIC is an acronym for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control. It is used to improve existing products and processes so that it can meet the customer's requirements. In the Define phase, you determine what the goals of the project are. In this case, you want to reduce the amount of time taken to deliver milk from the warehouse to the supermarket so that it is stocked on the supermarket shelves before 8.30 in the morning. In the measure phase, you measure the performance of the current unaltered process. The milk truck leaves at 7.30 a.m. in the morning and can take one of three routes A, B, and C. Route A is currently the preferred one as it takes only 60 minutes to reach the supermarket, compared to the routes B and C, which take 70 and 80 minutes respectively. In the Analyze phase, you find out why the defects exist. Since routes B and C were school bus routes, by reducing the starting time by one hour at 6.30 instead of 7.30 meant avoiding the traffic. Routes B and C now take 40 to 45 minutes to reach the supermarket. Route A still takes the milk truck one hour to get to the supermarket, even when the truck leaves at 6.30 a.m. In the Improve phase, performance can be improved by addressing and eliminating the root causes. Now that you've realized that advancing the milk pickup by an hour and changing the route to Route B can save time, you change the process accordingly, providing your workers with ample time to stock the milk into the shelves before the morning rush. And finally, in the Control phase, you make regular adjustments to control new processes and future performance. You continue to monitor the delivery times and try out alternate routes to continually improve the process and ensure even faster delivery. This process change led to reduced man hours and cost, enhanced sales, and customer retention. The Lean Six Sigma methodology offers many such benefits to businesses. 
let's take a look at some of them. 1. Increase in profits. 2. Standardized and simplified process. 3. Reduced errors. 4. Employee development. 5. Value to customers. And that is Lean Six Sigma for To make your journey more successful in Six Sigma, we introduce you postgraduate program in Lean Six Sigma by Simply Learn. So, what are you waiting for? Grab the course now, find the course link in the description box. The term Lean refers to creating more value to customers with fewer resources. It means reducing unwanted activities or processes that do not add value to the product or service for the customer. The Lean philosophy is to provide perfect value to the customer through a perfect value creation process that has zero waste. While the ultimate goal is to achieve zero waste, you may not always get that in the first couple of tries. However, you will achieve minimum waste and continue to move towards zero waste eventually. Hence, Lean is the path towards perfection. Lean is about optimizing the process from beginning to end, eliminating non-value adding activities, NVAs, and increasing flow to ensure that parts and services are provided to customers more quickly. If quality is the word to describe Six Sigma, then speed is the word to describe Lean. Let's understand the importance of Lean. There are many benefits of Lean, and some of them are reduced cost, reduced cycle time, more throughput, and increased productivity. Despite all of these benefits, Lean is not implemented by most of the organizations because of the misconception that it is only suited in manufacturing areas. The reason for this misconception is the beginning of Lean. It began and grew in popularity in the manufacturing areas, starting with Toyota. In recent years, one can notice more applications of Lean in other areas, such as healthcare and the transactional space. However, the truth is that Lean concepts can be applied in any business and in any process. On the next screen, let's discuss how Lean and Six Sigma combine. Lean and Six Sigma are two different principles or methodologies that combine to form and create one powerful continuous improvement methodology. They have various overlapping goals toward the improvement, with the aim of creating the most efficient system. Though the approaches are different, the methods complement each other. Lean Six Sigma takes the power and rigor of Six Sigma methodology and combines it with lean concepts, leading to faster results, better quality, and improved customer satisfaction. Let's look at the differences between lean and Six Sigma. Lean focuses on efficiency by identifying value from the customer's point of view, removing unnecessary steps in the process, and improving process speed or velocity. On the other hand, Six Sigma focuses on effectiveness with the help of breakthrough processes, identifying root causes, and reduction in variation. Therefore, when Six Sigma is combined with Lean, it is possible to achieve business transformation. So remember, Lean is about speed with a focus on efficiency, Six Sigma is about quality with a focus on effectiveness and Lean Six Sigma brings the best of both together. To yield a better result, first implement Lean to streamline the process. This helps to understand the chronic problems and the ways to handle them quickly. Once the problem is identified, use Six Sigma methodology to analyze the issues and provide business improvement transformation. In other words, Lean is used to reduce the waste and Six Sigma is used to reduce the variation. Let us start with an introduction to Six Sigma in the following screen. Six Sigma is a highly disciplined process that focuses on delivering near-perfect products and services consistently. Its strength is that it's a continuous improvement process with an unwavering focus on change empowerment, seamless training of resources, and continuous top management support. These three are known as the pillars of Six Sigma. If Six Sigma is implemented methodically, it will give sustained results for any process. Now the question arises as to what is a process? This will be explained in the next screen. A process is a series of steps designed to produce a product and or service according to the requirement of the customer. A process mainly consists of four parts, input, process steps, output, and feedback. 
Input is something put into a process or expended in its operation to achieve an output or a result. For example, man, material, machine, and management. Output is the final product delivered to an internal or external customer. For example, product or services. It is important to understand that if the output of a process is an input for another process, the latter process is the internal customer. Each input can be classified as controllable, represented as C, non-controllable, represented as NC, noise, represented as N, and critical, represented as X. The most important aspect of the process is the feedback. As can be inferred from the image, any change in the inputs causes change in the output. Therefore, Y equals F of X. Feedback helps in process control because it suggests changes to the inputs. Let us learn about the process of Six Sigma in the next screen. Let us understand how Six Sigma works in this screen. Six Sigma is successful because of the following reasons. Six Sigma is a management strategy. It creates an environment where the management supports Six Sigma as a business strategy and not as a standalone approach or a program to satisfy some public relations need. Six Sigma mainly emphasizes the DMAC method of problem solving. Focus teams are assigned well-defined projects that directly influence the organization's bottom line with customer satisfaction and increased quality being byproducts. Six Sigma also requires extensive use of statistical methods. The next screen will focus on some key terms used in Six Sigma. Let us look at the Sigma level chart in this screen. As discussed earlier, the Six Sigma quality means 3.4 defects in 1 million opportunities or a process with a 99.99966% yield. The Sigma level chart given on the screen shows the values for other Sigma levels. Please take a look at the values carefully. Let us understand the benefits of Six Sigma in the next screen. The organizational benefits of Six Sigma are as follows. A Six Sigma process eliminates the root cause of problems and defects in a process. Sometimes the solution is creating robust products and services that mitigate the impact of a variable input or output on a customer's experience. For example, many electrical utility systems have voltage variability up to and sometimes exceeding a 10% deviation from nominal value. Thus, most electrical products are built to tolerate the variability, drawing more amperage without damage to any components or the unit itself. Using Six Sigma reduces variation in a process and thereby reduces waste in a process. It ensures customer satisfaction and provides process standardization. Rework is substantially reduced because one gets it right the very first time. Further, Six Sigma addresses the key business requirement. Six Sigma can also be used by organizations to gain advantage and become world leaders in their respective fields. Ultimately, the whole Six Sigma process is to satisfy customers and achieve organizational goals. In the next screen, let us understand Six Sigma and quality. Taking a process to Six Sigma level ensures that the quality of the product is maintained. The primary goal of improved quality is increased profits for the organization. In very simple terms, quality is defined as the degree of excellence of a product or a service provided to the customer. It is conformance to customer requirement. If the customer is satisfied with the product or service, then the product or service is of the required quality. Let us look at the history of quality in the next screen. In the mid-1930s, Statistical Process Control, SPC, was developed by Walter Schuhart and used extensively during World War II to quickly expand the U.S.'s industrial capabilities. SPC is the application of statistical techniques to control any process. Walter Schuhart's work on the common cause of variation and special cause of variation, assignable, has been used proactively in all Six Sigma projects. The approach to quality has varied from time to time. In the 1960s, there were quality circles, which originated in Japan. It was started by Kaoru Ishikawa. 
Quality circles were self-improvement groups composed of small number of employees belonging to a single department. Quality circles brought in improvements with little or no help from the top management. In 1987, ISO 9000 was introduced. ISO stands for International Organization for Standardization. ISO 9000 is a set of international standards on quality management and quality assurance to help organizations implement quality management systems. ISO 9000 is still in effect. Baldridge Award, now known as the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award, was developed by the U.S. Congress in 1987 to raise awareness of quality management systems as well as recognize and award U.S. companies that have successfully implemented quality management systems. In 1988, another quality approach was developed known as benchmarking. In this approach, an organization measures its performance against the best organizations in its field, determines how such performance levels were achieved, and the information is used by the organization to improve itself. Then in the 1990s, there was the balanced scorecard approach. It is a management tool that helps managers of all levels to monitor their results in their key areas so that one metric is not optimized while another is ignored. During the year 1996 through 1997, an approach known as re-engineering was developed. This approach involved the restructuring of an entire organization and its processes. Integrating various functional tasks into cross-functional processes is one of the examples of re-engineering. In the next screen, let us find out about the quality gurus and their contribution to the field of quality. Let us focus on Six Sigma and the business system in this screen. Business systems are designed to implement a process or a set of processes. A business system ensures that process inputs are at the right place and at the right time so that each step of the process has the resource it needs. A business system design should be responsible for collecting and analyzing data so that continual improvement of its processes, products, and services is ensured. A business system has processes, sub-processes, and steps as its subsets. Human resources, manufacturing, and marketing are some examples of processes in a business system. Six Sigma improves a business system by continuously removing the defects in its processes and also by sustaining the changes. A defective item is any product or service that a customer would reject. A customer can be the user of the ultimate product or service, or can be the next process downstream in the business system. Let us learn about Six Sigma projects and organizational goals in the following screen. Let us understand the structure of the Six Sigma team in this screen. There are totally five levels in the Six Sigma screen. The first level consists of the top executives of the organization. These people lead change and provide direction as they own the vision of the organization. For any improvement initiative to work, it is important that top management of the organization be actively involved in its propagation. The top executives own the Six Sigma initiatives. Next in the level are Six Sigma champions. They identify and scope projects, develop deployment and strategy, and support cultural change. They also identify and coach master black belts. Three to four master black belts work under every champion. Six Sigma master black belts train and coach black belts, green belts, and various functional leaders of the organization. They usually have at least three to four black belts under them. The fourth level in Six Sigma structure is Six Sigma black belts. They apply strategies to specific projects and lead and direct teams to execute projects. Finally, there are Six Sigma Green Belts. They support the Black Belt employees by participating in project teams. Green Belts play a dual role. They work on the project and perform day-to-day -day jobs related to their work area. In the next screen, we will understand the drivers and metrics of organizational strategy. While financial accounting is useful to track physical assets, the Balanced Scorecard, or BSC, 
offers a more holistic approach to strategy implementation and performance measurement by taking into account perspectives other than the financial one. For an organization, traditional strategic activities that concentrate only on financial metrics are not sufficient to predict future performance. They are not sufficient to implement and control the strategic plan either. BSC translates the organizational strategy into actionable objectives that can be met on an everyday basis and provides a framework for performance measurement. The balanced scorecard helps clarify the organizational vision and mission to workable action items to be carried out and measured. It also provides feedback on both internal business processes and external outcomes. By doing so, it enables continuous improvement in strategic performance toward achieving organizational goals. The balanced scorecard achieves all this by integrating the organizational strategy with a limited number of key metrics from four major areas of performance – finance, customer relations, internal processes, and learning and growth. Many organizations in the world use balanced scorecard approaches and the number is increasing every day. In the next screen, we will describe the Balanced Scorecard Framework. We will learn about developing a Balanced Scorecard in this screen. While applying the Balanced Scorecard in an organization, care must be taken to account for interactions between different perspectives or strategic business units and avoid optimizing the results of one at the expense of another. To outline the strategy, a top-down approach is followed by determining the strategic objectives, measures, targets, and initiatives for each perspective. The strategic objectives refer to the strategy to be achieved in that perspective. Three or four leading objectives are agreed upon. The progress toward strategic objectives is assessed using specific measures. These measures should be closely related to the actual performance drivers. This enables effectively evaluating progress. High-level metrics are linked to lower-level operational measures. The target values for each measure are set. The initiatives required to achieve the target value are identified. As already mentioned, this exercise is carried out for all the perspectives. Finally, the scorecard is integrated into the management system. In the next screen, let us understand the change in the approach to the balanced scorecard from the four box model of BSC to strategy maps. In earlier approaches to the balanced scorecard, the perspectives were presented in a four box model. This kind of scorecard was more a comprehensive glance at the key performance indicators or metrics in different perspectives. However, the key performance indicators or metrics of different perspectives were viewed independent of each other which led to a silo-based approach and lack of integration. However, modern scorecards place the focus on the interrelations between the objectives and metrics of different perspectives and how they support each other. A well-designed, balanced scorecard recognizes the influence of one perspective on another and the effect of these interactions on organizational strategy. To achieve the objectives in one perspective, it is necessary to achieve the objectives in another perspective. In short, the four perspectives form a chain of cause and effect relationships. A map of interlinked objectives from each perspective is created. These objectives represent the performance drivers, which determine the effectiveness of strategy implementation. This is called a strategy map. The function of a strategy map is to outline what the organization wants to accomplish and how it plans to accomplish it. The strategy map is one page view of how the organization can create value. For example, financial success is dependent on giving customers what they want, which in turn depends on the internal processes and learning and growth at an individual level. In the next screen, we will look at the impact of the Balanced Scorecard on the organization. The Balanced Scorecard and Strategy Map force managers to consider cause and effect relationships, which leads to better identification of key drivers and a more rounded approach to strategic planning. The BSC enables the organization to improve in the following ways. Being a one-page document, 
a strategy map can easily be communicated and facilitates understanding at all levels of the organization. An organization is successful in meeting its objectives only when everyone understands the strategy. The balanced scorecard also forces an organization to measure what really matters and manage information better so that quality of decision making is higher. Creating performance reports against a balanced scorecard allows for a structured approach to reporting progress. It also enables organizations to create reports and dashboards to communicate performance transparently and meaningfully. As expected, a balanced scorecard helps an organization to better align itself and its processes to the strategic goals outlined in the BSC. The overall objectives of the BSC can be cascaded into each business unit to enable that unit to work toward the common organizational goal. All the activities of the organization, such as budgeting or risk management, are automatically aligned to the strategic objectives. To conclude, the Balanced Scorecard is a simple and powerful tool that, when implemented correctly, equips an organization to perform better. Let us proceed to the next topic of this lesson in the following screen. In this topic, we will look at what lean is and how lean is applied to a process. Let us start with the lean concepts in the next screen. Let us look at the process issues in this screen. Lean focuses on three major issues in a process, known by their Japanese names, Muda, Mura, and Murai. Muda refers to non-value-adding work. Mura represents unevenness, and Mari represents overburden. Together, they represent the key aspects in lean. Let us look at the types of waste in the next screen. There are seven types of muda, or waste, as per lean principles. Let us understand these seven types of muda. Overproduction. This refers to producing more than is required. For example, a customer needed 10 products and 12 were delivered. Inventory. In simple words, this refers to stock. The term inventory includes finished goods, semi-finished goods, raw materials, supplies kept in waiting, and some of the work in progress. For example, test scripts waiting to be executed by the testing team, defects, repairs, rejects, any product or service deemed unusable by the customer or any effort to make it usable to the original customer or a new customer. For example, errors found in the source code of a payroll module by quality control team. Motion. A waste due to poor ergonomics of the workplace. For example, finance and account teams sit on the first floor, but invoices to customers are printed on the ground floor, causing unnecessary personnel movement. Overprocessing. Additional process on a product or service to remove unnecessary attribute or feature is overprocessing. For example, a customer needs a bottle and you deliver a bottle with extra plastic casing. A customer needs ABEC3 bearing and your process is tuned to produce more precise ABEC7 bearings, taking more time for something the customer doesn't need. Waiting. When a part waits for processing or the operator waits for work, the wastage of waiting occurs. For example, improper scheduling of staff members. Transport. When the product moves unnecessarily in the process without adding value. For example, a product is finished and yet it travels 10 kilometers to the warehouse before it gets shipped to the customer. Another example, an electronic form is transferred to 12 people, some of them seeing the form more than once. That is, the form is traveling over the same space multiple times. Next, we will look at lean wastes other than the seven types of waste discussed. Some lean experts talk about additional areas of waste. Underutilized skills. Skills are underutilized when the workforce has capabilities that are not being fully used toward productive efforts. People are assigned to jobs in which they do not fit. Underperforming processes. Automation of poorly performing process. Improving a process that should be eliminated if possible. For example, the product returns department or product discounts process. Asymmetry in processes that should be eliminated. For example, two signatures to approve a cost reduction and six signatures to reverse a cost reduction that created higher costs in other areas. 
In the next screen, we will look at an exercise on identifying the waste type. We will cover each step of the lean process in the next few screens. In this screen, we will learn about the first step, identify value. To implement lean to a process, it is important to find out what the customer wants. Once this is done, the process should be evaluated to identify what it needs to possess to meet customer requirements. The next screen will focus on the next step of the lean process, value stream mapping. In this screen, we will discuss the differences between push and pull processes. An organization can adopt either of these processes depending on the requirement. Contrary to a pull process, in a push process, the first step is to forecast the demand for a product or service. The production line then begins to fill this demand and produced parts are stocked in anticipation of customer demand. For example, a garments manufacturer produces 200 shirts based on expected demand and then waits for customer orders for them. Note that the demand is expected and not actual. Discounts offered to customers by big retailers are examples of the push process. If the garment company adopts a pull process instead, it would start making the shirts only after receiving a confirmed demand from customers. Note that although the pull approach seems better, it is not applicable to all situations. For example, a pharmacy uses a push process. In the next screen, we will learn about theory of constraints. Let us look at an example for the TOC methodology in this screen. The three sub-processes in the packing process are coating or printing, filling, and sealing. The data for the three sub-processes are observed and collected as number of units produced in an hour. The data is as follows. Coating or printing is 900 units per hour. Filling is 720 units per hour and sealing is 780 units per hour. How can you implement the TOC methodology in this example? Let us build the TOC map for this example. The first step in the TOC methodology is to identify the constraint. Looking at the data, the output per hour from the filling process is 720. This is the constraint in the system. In the second step, the constraint is exploited by analyzing the performance using data. To break the constraint, a repair and maintenance personnel can be assigned to maintain the filling machine on a daily basis. In the third step, the other fixes in the repair and maintenance function are made as subordinate decisions to the one taken in step two. In this example, carry out the maintenance of the filling machine. In the fourth step, the constraint is elevated by implementing the decisions. In this example, remove the damages from the filling machine. The next step is to go back to step one and identify the next system constraint. As per the data collected after implementation of the first cycle of the TOC, sealing can be identified as the next system constraint. Let us now analyze the data before and after TOC implementation in this example. The number of units produced per hour before implementing the TOC in coding or printing process was 900 units. Filling process was 720 units and sealing process was 780 units. After implementing the TOC, the number of units produced per hour for the filling process increased to 840 from 720 units. Let us proceed to the next topic of this lesson. In this topic, we will discuss the concepts in Design for Six Sigma, or DFSS. Let us first understand DFSS in the next screen. DFSS, or Design for Six Sigma, is a business process methodology that ensures that any new product or service meets customer requirements, and the process for that product or service is already at Six Sigma level. DFSS uses tools such as Quality Function Deployment, or QFD, and Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, or FMEA. DFSS can help a business system to introduce an entirely new product or service for the customer. It can also be used to introduce a new category of product or service for the business system. For example, an FMCG company plans to make a new brand of hair oil, 
a type of product already in the market. DFSS also improves the product or service and adds to the current product or service lines. To implement DFSS, a business system has to know its customer requirements. DFSS can be used to design a new product or service, a new process for a new product or service, or redesign of an existing product or service to meet customer requirements. Let us learn about processes for DFSS in the next screen. The two major processes for DFSS are IDOV and DMADV. IDOV stands for Identify, Design, Optimize, and Verify. DMADV stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Design, and Verify. In the IDOV process, the first step involves identifying specific customer needs based on which the new product and business process will be designed. The next step involves design, which involves identifying functional requirements, developing alternate concepts, evaluating the alternatives, selecting a best fit concept, and predicting sigma capability. Tools such as FMEA are used here. The third step, optimize, uses a statistical approach to calculate tolerance with respect to the desired output. When IDOV is implemented to design a process expected to work at Six Sigma level, this is checked in the Optimize phase. If the process does not meet expectations, the Optimize phase helps in developing detailed design elements, predicting performances, and optimizing design. The last stage of IDOV is to verify that is, to test and validate the design, and finally to check conformance to Six Sigma standards. The other process, DMADV, has five stages. The first stage is to define the customer requirements and goals for the process, product, or service. Next, measure and match performance to customer requirements. The third stage involves analysis and assessment of the design for the process, product, or service. The next step is to design and implement the array of latest processes required for the new process, product, or service. The final stage is to verify results and maintain performance. In the next screen, we will look at the differences between IDOV and DMADV. The primary difference between IDOV and DMADV is that while IDOV is used only to design a new product or service, DMADV can be used to design either a new product or service or redesign an existing product or service. IDOV involves design of a new process, while DMADV involves redesigning an existing process. In IDOV, no analysis or measurement of existing process is done, and the whole development is new. The design step immediately follows the identification of customer requirements. In contrast, DMADV, the existing product, service, or process, is examined thoroughly before moving to the design phase. The design stage comes only after defining requirements and analyzing the existing product, service, or process. In the following screen, we will learn about Tool Quality Function Deployment, or QFD, which is one of the DFSS tools. QFD, also called Voice of Customer, or VOC, or House of Quality, is a predefined method of identifying customer requirements. It is a systematic process to understand the needs of the customer and convert them into a set of design and manufacturing requirements. QFD motivates business to focus on its customers and design products that are competitive in lesser time and at lesser cost. The primary learning from QFD includes which customer requirements are most important, what the organization's strengths and weaknesses are, where an organization should focus their efforts, and where most of the work needs to be done. To learn from QFD, the organization should ask relevant questions to customers and tabulate them to bring out a set of parameters critical to the design of the product. Apart from understanding customer requirements, it is also important to know what would happen if a particular product or service fails when being used by a customer. 
It is necessary to understand the effects of failure on the customer to ensure preventive actions are taken and to be able to answer the customers in the event of failure. In the next screen, we will look at another DFSS tool, Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, or FMEA. Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, or FMEA, is a preemptive tool that helps any system to identify potential pitfalls at all levels of a business system. It helps the organization to identify and prioritize the different failure modes of its product or service and what effect the failure would have on the customer. It helps in identifying the critical areas in a system on which the organization's efforts can be focused. Note that while FMEA enables identification of critical areas, it does not offer solutions to the identified problems. We will look at the varieties of FMEA, such as DFMEA and PFMEA, in the next screen. PFMEA stands for Process Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, and DFMEA stands for Design Failure Mode and Effects Analysis. PFMEA is used on a new or existing process to uncover potential failures. It is done in the quality planning phase to act as an aid during production. A process FMEA can involve fabrication, assembly, transactions, or services. DFMEA is used in the design of a new product, service, or process to uncover potential failures. The purpose is to find out how failure modes affect the system and to reduce the effect of failure on the system. This is done before the product is sent to manufacturing. All design deficiencies are sorted out at the end of this process. In the following screen, we will understand FMEA Risk Priority Number. FMEA Risk Priority Number, or RPN, is a measure used to quantify or assess risk associated with the design or process. Assessing risk helps identify critical failure modes. Higher the RPN, higher the priority the product or process receives. RPN is a product of three numbers, severity of a failure, occurrence of a failure, and the detectability of a failure. All these numbers are given a value on a scale of 1 to 10. The minimum value of RPN is 1, and the maximum value is 1,000. A failure mode with a high occurrence rating means the failure mode occurs very frequently. A mode with a high severity rating means that the mode is really critical to ensure safety of operations. A mode with a high detection rating means that the current controls are not sufficient. In the next screen, we will look at the FMEA table. The FMEA table helps plan improvement initiatives by underlining why and how failure modes occur and helps organizations plan for their prevention. Typically, FMEA is applied on the output of root cause analysis and is a better tool for focus or prioritization as compared to multi-voting. One important aspect of FMEA is that it does not need data. Experts in a particular area can form the FMEA table without having to look at data from any source. In functions such as human resources, the FMEA table is very useful as there might not be much data available to the problem-solving team. The sample FMEA table is given on the screen. Please go through the contents for better understanding. In the following screen, we will discuss severity of risk priority number and scale criteria. Let us first discuss severity. Severity refers to the seriousness of the effect of the failure mode or how critical the failure mode is to the customer or the process. The severity of a failure mode is rated on a scale of 1 to 10 using a severity table. Different industries follow different structures for the severity table. A high severity rating indicates a mode is critical to operational safety. For example, a team working on FMEA of a radioactive plant may insert fatal as the effect with rating 10. Another example is the severity table for a sports team. The team manager wants to rate the severity of failure of the team in an upcoming game. 
she might rate it at 9 given that the team would lose a big sponsorship should they face defeat, which could in turn be hazardous to the team's future. Shown here is a generalized table of severity. The severity rating can never be changed. For example, if a mode has a rating of 9 before improvement, it will continue to have a rating of 9 after improvement too. Let us look at occurrence of RPM and scale criteria. Occurrence is the probability that a specific cause will result in the particular failure mode. As with severity, occurrence is rated on a scale of 1 to 10 based on a table. Like the severity table, higher the occurrence of a failure, higher is its rating. Again, this table might vary depending on the industry and scenario. Sometimes, the project team can use data here if available. Based on past data, the probability of occurrence of a failure can easily be rated. Shown here is a generalized table. Let us next look at detection of RPN and scale criteria. Detection is the probability that a particular failure will be detected. The table shown here is again a generalized one. The rating here is a bit different from severity or occurrence. Higher the detectability of a failure, lower is its rating. This is because if the failure can easily be detected, then everyone would know of it and therefore there would be less or no damage. For example, if detection is impossible, the failure is given a rating of 10. Please note that at the start of a Six Sigma project, the failure mode is given a relatively high detection rating. Let us look at an example of FMEA and RPN in the next screen. In this example, a bank wants to recognize and prioritize the risks involved in the process of withdrawing cash from an ATM. It can be observed from the table that not having a control in place for network issues has the highest RPN. This is due to the detectability for a network issue being very low. The next set of information in the table shows the action taken by the bank's management to address the failure modes. Following the implementation, the new RPN is calculated retaining the security level at 9. This is because the actions were not directed at reducing the severity but at the causes of failure. It can be seen that the new RPN is much lower, and the risk for both causes has been mitigated. To make your journey more successful in Six Sigma, we introduce you postgraduate program in Lean Six Sigma by Simply Learn. So, what are you waiting for? Grab the course now, find the course link in the description box. This lesson will cover the details of the define phase. Let us start with the objectives of the lesson in the next screen. After completing this lesson, you will be able to explain various components of project identification, describe customer data collection methods, list various means of project documentation, discuss risk analysis and management, describe project management and planning tools, explain the concepts used in evaluation of project performance, discuss team stages and dynamics, let us start with the first topic in the following screen. In this topic, we will discuss project identification. Let us see the prerequisites of a Six Sigma project in the following screen. Six Sigma can be applied to everything around. It can be applied across almost 70 different sectors. However, it cannot be applied to all problems. The first step is to check if the project qualifies to be a Six Sigma project. The questions that need to be asked are as follows. Is there an existing process? To implement the DMAC methodology of problem solving, a process needs to exist. The Six Sigma process is known as DMAIC. DMAIC comprises five phases, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. These phases are the roadmap to problem solving and improving our processes. The effectiveness of Six Sigma method is derived from its structure. Each phase has an overarching objective and specific deliverables that need to be completed, which helps us achieve the objectives. The purpose of the defined phase is to document the problem, 
the desired outcome, goals, and deliverables. The purpose of the measure phase is to obtain baseline process performance levels and quantify the problem. The focus of the analyze phase is to identify the key root causes for process variation and defects. The purpose of the improve phase is to develop, test, and implement the solutions. The goal of the control phase is to monitor the key factors and maintain the gains. You learn the aspects of the DMAIC process. Now we'll look at the tools used in each phase. The list of tools corresponds to the DMAIC phase in which they are used. The use or application of these tools gives the expected deliverables in each DMAIC phase for a Greenbelt. Some of the tools listed are not required in every Six Sigma Greenbelt project. These tools give us an insight into the problem and lead us toward the real issues in our processes. That is, with more experience, you are likely to know the tools you need for your projects. In the define phase, we use SIPOC, Voice of the Customer, or VOC, Critical to Quality, CTQ, the Quality Function Deployment, or QFD, Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, known as the FMEA or the FMEA, and the Cause and Effect CNE matrix. In the measure phase, we use Measurement System Analysis, or MSA, Control Charts, Process Capability, and Normality Plots. In the Analyze phase, we use Simple Linear Regression, or SLR, Pareto Charts, Fishbone Diagram, Failure Modes and Effects Analysis, the FAMIA, Multivariate Charts, and Hypothesis Testing. In the Improve phase, we use Brainstorming, Piloting, and also the Failure Modes Effects Analysis and Design of Experiments, DOE. In the last phase, Control, we use Control Charts, a Control Plan, and measurement system analysis. Pareto chart is a histogram ordered by the frequency of occurrence of events. It is also known as the 80-20 rule or vital few, trivial many. It helps project teams to focus on the issues which cause the highest number of defects or complaints. To explain further, the given chart plots all the causes for defects in a product or service. The values are represented in descending order by bars, and the cumulative total is represented by the line. Pareto chart emphasizes that 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. Thus, a Pareto chart narrows the scope of the project, or problem solving, by identifying the major causes affecting quality. Pareto charts are useful only when required data is available. If data is not available, then other tools, such as brainstorming and multi-voting, should be used to find the root cause of any problem. Network diagrams are one of the tools used by the project manager for project planning. They are also sometimes referred to as arrow diagrams because they use arrows to connect activities and represent precedents and interdependencies between activities of a project. There are some assumptions that need to be made while forming the network diagram. The first assumption is that before a new activity begins, all pending activities have been completed. The second assumption is that all arrows indicate logical precedence. This means that the direction of the arrow represents the sequence that activities need to follow. The last assumption is that a network diagram must start from a single event and end with a single event. There cannot be multiple start and end points to the network diagram. Critical path method, also known as CPM, is an important tool used by project managers to monitor the progress of the project and to ensure that the project is on schedule. The critical path for a project is the longest sequence of tasks on the network diagram. The critical path in the given network diagram is highlighted in orange. Critical path is characterized by zero slack for all tasks on the sequence. This means that the smallest delay in any of the tasks on the critical path will cause a delay in the overall timeline of the project. This makes it very important for the project manager to closely monitor the tasks on the critical path and ensure that the tasks go smoothly. If needed, the project manager can divert resources from other tasks that are not on the critical path to tasks on the critical path to ensure that the project is not delayed. 
When a project manager removes resources from such tasks, he needs to ensure that the task does not become a critical path task because of the reduced number of resources. During the execution of the project, the critical path can easily shift because of multiple factors and hence needs to be constantly monitored by the project manager. A complex project can also have multiple critical paths. Here we wrap up this topic. If you have any queries, feel free to post them and our experts will be happy to help. Thank you for watching. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts, choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.